Hi, I'm Dr. Rob Silverman, Amazon best-selling author of Inside Out Health and host of Proven Health Alternatives. Today I have a guest that is very close to my heart because when you hear his story, he's going to motivate you to do better. He had a brain injury and he was able to come back from this brain injury and now he's helping everybody that he can get his hands on that has a brain injury. His name is Mr. Kevin Ballister. He has a great book called Feed a Brain. This is an episode you don't want to miss. Hi, everybody. Dr. Rob Silverman here, Proven Health Alternatives. I've got a good friend of mine, a true inspiration. Anytime I'm down, anytime my brain lags, anytime I'm not ready to go for it, I've got Calvin Ballister here to make me feel good. This man has one of the most incredible stories you will ever hear. He's a true inspiration to myself and anybody that I talk about. He's all over the place giving motivational speeches about the brain. Let me take a second and read his bio because it's without question um, very deep and more so than very deep, it, it's, it's truly heart-wrenching and motivating. Calvin Ballister is a severe traumatic brain injury survivor who was given less than 10% chance of recovery beyond a persistent vegetative state. While he beat the odds and woke from a coma, he was unable to eat, walk, or talk for months, and his left hand was effectively unusable. Calvin employed various methods on his own to restore his brain function. He's now fully functional and has now dedicated his life to improving neural rehabilitation and hospital nutrition. He is the creator of adventuresinbraininjury.com, feedabrain.com, host of Adventures in Brain Injury podcast, the author of a great book. I have it right here, and I've read it already once, going on number two. He's the author of How to Feed a Brain, Nutrition for Optimum Brain Function Repair. Calvin also privately works with clients to implement cutting-edge practices, even in a hospital setting. I want you to explain about that and to empower patients, practitioners, and caregivers to take care of their brains, bodies, and their soul. Gavin, how are you today? Yeah, man, I'm awesome. It's always so good to hang with you. It was so good to be at your, uh, your seminar last week, I think. Um, right, yeah. And yeah, you, you slayed it. You are so good up there. You, you teach so effectively. And I ended up taking a bunch of pictures and put them on my Instagram story. And people were like, thank you so much for this. This is awesome. Thanks. I really appreciate it. It was great to have you there. We got to spend some time. We, uh, we got to spend some time the night before. We had breakfast together. Um, I was going crazy. I didn't have any internet. So Kevin was helping me with some of those. But what we were really doing is we were bonding as friends and we were talking about brain. Because brain is very uh, important to both of us. So why don't you tell everybody, you, you have quite a story. Just, just mm -hmm. tell everybody your story, what happened. And you should say some of those pictures that you showed me. That they are, as I said before, heart-wrenching. Yeah. I was pretty well when I saw it. Yeah, I would be happy to. So I, as you said, I sustained a severe traumatic brain injury. Um, I fell from a rooftop water tower in Brooklyn hit the front of my head on the seal scaffolding back in the concrete rooftop, instantly unconscious, rushed to the hospital, put on life support. And while I was in a coma, my family was told that I had less than a 10% chance of ever waking. And even if I did wake up, they were told that I would likely remain in a persistent vegetative state. So clearly, spoiler alert, I woke up and it was very, very difficult at that point. Like I, I couldn't eat, I couldn't walk, I couldn't talk. I was breathing through a tube of my neck. I was receiving nutrition through a tube of my belly. And um, I'd like to talk about that as well. We'll, we'll yeah. get to that. But it's like, I mean, I was a musician before this as well. And now I couldn't talk, let alone sing. And my left hand was totally flexed inward. I couldn't even wrap it around the neck of a guitar, let alone play. It's like my life's over. And this is, this is where mindset and the choice of our attention can, comes in. And, and I essentially was like, you know what? I need to choose a new perspective here. 
this is an adventure. I'm on this ride either way, right? Like I'm, I'm on the ride. I can go on a kicking and screaming or I can be like, this is an adventure. And that's what I did. I, I took that perspective and was able to live my life in a way to, of, of curiosity of what was going to happen rather than fear of like losing everything. And I think that played so much into my recovery. And the reason I bring up the like mental aspect of things is because when people are in a place where they are, when they're in a, a medical crisis of any sort, you know, um, it feels stuck. It feels debilitating. There's all sorts of like fear that comes in. And when we can replace that with, with faith and certainty that we're going to be okay, confidence, kind of beyond confidence and knowing that, that it's going to be okay. We're going to heal from this. And then just have curiosity of how that's going to happen. It's awesome. So that's that. Sorry, went on a little bit of a tangent there, but it's so important when you're working with clients, is helping them to get into that place and and find that drive within them. Oh yes, I I I couldn't eat, walk, or talk, and I'm going through this, and a lot went into my recovery, right? Uh, a lot, a lot. And at one point, I was steered towards a nutritional protocol. And I began to regain some clarity. And I was like, whoa. First of all, what happened? Because I've been in a brain fog for a long time. And here's the thing about a brain fog. You don't know you're in a brain fog when you're in a brain fog because you're in a brain fog, you know? So as I came out of that fog, I began to regain some clarity and I was like, okay, first of all, what happened? So I'm going through medical records, text messages, emails. And then why did nutrition make such a big difference? And what else can I do to give my brain the best shot to recover? And what it comes down to is giving, well, nutritionally, and as I said, a lot went into it. But nutrition is the building blocks, which is why my first book is about nutrition. It's about supplying the building blocks for the cells to function optimally. Because when, the, when, when our bodies, when our brains, when any of the hardware that we possess is functioning optimally, it's repairing itself optimally. Mm -hmm. and this is the beauty of functional medicine giving the ingredients and stimulating the cells of our body to function because function is health. I agree wholeheartedly here, here, indeed. Um, you said a lot. I always like to ask a question and then delve into the question. So in no order, I know you wanted to get to, I've got them all up here. You said you were getting a feeding tube because this is so huge, a feeding tube in your gut. Let's have a little back and forth. What did they put in the feeding tube? Well, all right. Yeah. Like, like it's been my mission. I actually wrote this in my blog in, I think, 2013. It's my mission to improve neurorehabilitation. And neurorehabilitation usually starts in the hospital. Neurorehabilitation is how we rehabilitate the brain after injury, after disease, conditions, whatever. And it usually starts in the hospital, but what do we feed people in the hospital? Now, we, we all, it's like the butt of jokes, right? Like hospital food, it's gross, right? Jello and, and oatmeal and like whatever. Um, so, all right, hospital food is gross and nutrition matters. That needs to change. And then gastric feed nutrition Man, can you imagine what the processed liquid formulas that are fed to patients that are unable to eat conventionally, what is in that? If the, if the food is gross, that stuff, let me give you some of those ingredients. Please. Glucose syrup, 
soy protein isolate, corn maltodextrin, milk protein concentrate, canola oil. Breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner for months or years for some patients. So let me get this I straight. get clients that come to me, they're receiving this five times a day. So let me get this straight. It's sugar for the most part, for the most part. And if they decide to give you a little protein, it's soy and dairy protein, if you will. Now, mm -hmm. my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, the brain is 60 plus percent fat, does not function well on sugar. If anything, as I recall, Diabetes type three used to be referred to as Alzheimer's. So your brain doesn't work on sugar, it works on fat. So the exact thing that damages your brain is what they're giving in the feeding tube. Precisely, yeah. And not only the brain, the, the body in general, like glycation occurs from, from blood sugar spikes and dips. and. You want to give somebody a blood sugar spike, give them glucose syrup, like straight up. Like they're not even give it to giving them. anything straight glucose. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's basically fortified glucose syrup and fortified being like putting in synthetic vitamins and minerals in really like the cheapest forms that they can. So, because what it comes down to is, is is dinero is finding the cheapest method to to uh give patients nutrition quote unquote nutrition it's not to steal your thunder i agree with you it's cheaper and carbohydrates do not allow for a scent in the diaper that people are wearing at that point um the other thing would be and i've had multiple conversations with people everybody should be getting an omega-3 liquid in there, at least that. And I don't want to steal any of your thunder on Feed Your Brain and when we talk about some of the protocols, but everybody should know it doesn't matter. Right now, they all should know that omega-3, uh, mm -hmm. fish oils, uh, fatty acids, if you will, are a critical element. It's a great substitute. There's been a lot of documented cases where they switch that for the sugar. Um, but again, I know you work with clients and I know you work with clients in a hospital setting why don't you just very quickly say what you suggest they should put in the feeding tube? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, first off, like you said, omega threes are very important, and not not any omega three. Like flax oil isn't going to work because we want we want it high in EPA and DHA, especially DHA. And the problem with uh, vegan sources, most vegan sources, algae is an exception. But most vegan sources of omega threes are ALA, which um, alpha linoleic acid, which does not contain any DHA. It can be converted to DHA, but our body's ability to convert is like two to four percent when we're healthy. So we would need to drink gallons of flax oil. And uh, we we definitely get the run from that and have digestive <laughs> issues as a result. So that's not really an option. We want to get high DHA and EPA um, omega threes. And I have a, a page on my website feedofbrain.com forward slash omega, and that really lays out the research. I, I do a research roundup of how omega-3s are really powerful for brain injury recovery. And then what often um, the, the pushback you'll get from the hospital is usually about blood thinning. And I address that as well in there and I do a research roundup on blood thinning. I'm gonna stop you how, right there. I don't mean to interrupt you, right there. Cause this is a question patients ask and I'm sure your clients ask. Everybody believes that fish oil thin the blood. Can we have that discussion right now? Yes, please. Tell please. everybody how many articles that they found or has been found that fish oils thin the blood. Yeah, and they were they were they were even admitted that they were poor. Um, that there was like different variables. That it wasn't very conclusive. 
that it's thin to blood in the actual article. They admit that. They're like, yeah, it's not it's not that good, but it looks like it might thin the blood. And uh, I, I found two. Um, and then I found a meta-analysis that was looking at all of this and was like, yeah, there's no problem. There's right. no deleterious effects. Was the deleterious effects to platelet aggregation, even with warfarin or aspirin? So even with other things that thin the blood, it doesn't. So, yeah, it's not a concern. And what you can do is you go to feedabrain.com forward slash omega, and I, I've organized the research for this so that if you get any pushback on this aspect, you have a research to back it up right there from, from well-respected peer-reviewed journals. So the end of the discussion with this, to su summarize, is there are no articles with omega-3s on their own that conclusively have said they thin blood. Therefore, what we understand, and we're not making a medical diagnosis, I recommend, and I know you do too, for everybody that we work with, fish oils for these type of injuries are the way to go. Because on the other side of the coin are this robust amount, and you've got a tremendous amount of citations in your book on the fact that fish oils are great for brain injuries. Period, end of discussion. A much better healthy choice than sugar on steroids in the feeding, tape, the feeding uh, tube. Here's my other question. Why do you think nutrition made such a big difference in your recovery? Well, you know, that's what I said. I was like, why did nutrition make such a big difference? And then I dove into study with that, right? Like, why? Because it clearly did. You know, like all of a sudden I went from being in a brain fog to slowly emerging from that. And the, 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 what, what the catalyst was for that was I was steered towards a nutritional protocol. And that nutritional protocol was actually an apex le leaky gut protocol. And um, I began to regain some clarity and I began to dive into study and try to understand digestion, metabolism, neurometabolism, how the brain derives energy. But digestion is first off. So we need, basically, I think of it like this. Many connections in my brain have been damaged. And I think of rebuilding those connections like building a bridge. So what do you need to build a bridge? You need supplies and you need skilled workers. Supplies would be the nutrition, the brain building nutrition, the right kind of nutrition, how to feed a brain. And... Skilled workers would be the therapy, the targeted therapy, the right kind of therapy. But also, we need to get the supplies to the construction site, and that's digestion. And so suddenly, when, as, as my digestive system was healing, I was actually getting the nutrients that I was ingesting. I was actually getting the nutrients from the food I was eating into my bloodstream and to my brain. And now that I had supplies going to my brain, in addition to anti-inflammatories and things of that sort, I was able to rebuild those connections. Now the, the trucks were getting to the construction site with the supplies. And I could, I could start building these pathways, rebuilding things. And I was able to introduce antioxidants and things that would reduce the brain swelling and um and and clean up some of the free radicals in my brain and allow it to heal a bit how did you learn so much about nutrition in the brain i mean <laughs> i know you didn't go to med school you don't have a phd i know you're extraordinarily knowledgeable and smart tell everybody <laughs> yeah so before this i was a, i was a musician I was a musician. I bartended in New York. Like New this York was City. not on my radar at all, you know? And basically as I regained clarity, I was like, okay, what happened? Why nutrition? And what else can I do? And it's like, I was studying like my life depended on it because it did. 
you know? And it, it's not, it, it, was, it was interesting because, well, not interesting. It's awesome that we have the internet. This like, this resource that is the internet. I don't know if you read the acknowledgements in my book, but I actually like acknowledge the internet for being such a valuable resource. And it's actually a pretty common um, sentiment from people who are in a debilitating situation. And it's like, they can't walk or go places, but we have this tool at our fingertips where we can get all this information. So I was relearning how to walk at the time, but I was watching videos, I was listening to podcasts, I learned about online courses, and I started taking online courses from universities like, like Cal Poly Tech and the University of San Francisco and Johns Hopkins and Duke University and the University of Chicago. And I was learning about neurology. I was learning about nutrition. And by the way, the nutrition I learned from, from so-called higher education was in line with the USDA's uh, uh, recommendations, which are basically, which I'm, I'm gonna touch on this. The USDA is the US Department of Agriculture. And if you go to their website, under under about us it says what we do we have a and i'm paraphrasing here but we have an interest in providing economic opportunity for rural america to thrive this is not about human nutrition this is not about human health this is about economic opportunity for for u.s agriculture so why is it that U.S. agriculture is controlling our, our, I mean, basically in any, any uh, institution that receives any government funding and serves food needs to be following the USDA recommendations. Wow, there's a little conflict of interest there when it comes to the difference between health and economic opportunity. Do you want your hospital to be more focused on economic opportunity for U.S. agriculture? Or do you want a hospital to be focused on your health? And I think that's, that's the crux of where we're at with this system. And um, I may have gone on a tangent, but uh, the, and yeah, if you want to reel me back in, I'm going to reel you in. Here's what we're going to do. Here's his book, How to Feed a Brain. As I said before, I've read it. Nutrition for Optimum Brain Function and Repair. And um, I'm working on the, the second go around. The forward was uh, written by Dr. Tatis Karazian, who is also a chiropractor. He is a, without question, I, this word is overused, but for him it's appropriate, a genius. Um, here we have Dave, Dr. David Perlmutter. Everybody knows the leading functional medicine neurologist probably in the world. And his exact quote was, his ideas are absolutely in line with current neuroscience and have the added validation of his personal experience. It's signed. Thank you. We've got a ton of people in here. It's an easy read. How can they get a copy of this book? And right. after you can tell them how you get a copy, is this book for people with just brain injuries or is it for everybody? Even if it's not for brain injury, like, like it, again, it's nutrition for optimal brain function. Mm -hmm. Because when the brain is functioning optimally, it's repairing itself optimally. Absolutely. So we want to give our brain the nutritional tools to function optimally. So whether you've had a brain injury, been in a coma like me, or, or you never had a brain injury, or if you've had a few concussions, because the fact is, you probably had a few brain injuries. For the book, Amazon.com, get get the book on Amazon um, and find me at feedabrain.com or feedabrain on all the social medias. You deal with clients, and I know you really wanted to take some time talking about what you do, how you help them, how you help them in a hospital setting, and what services you offer, because I think they're of tremendous value. So the floor is now yours. Sure, thanks, man. Yeah, it's 
As I said, I often work with clients who sometimes have a loved one in a hospital setting going through situations similar to what I went through. And I mean, I also work with people throughout the spectrum of recovery and brain optimization. But, um, but most important to me, what, where I get the most reward is working in the most difficult cases with people who have a loved one in a hospital setting. Often while they're still in a coma or they're, they're, they're going through recovery and they're receiving you know, as I said, that garbage five times a day. And what I do is I work with them to bring, I, I forget work with them, I partner with them. Because nobody is prepared for a medical crisis. And what happens is you get hit with this medical crisis. You have a loved one in a, a crisis. And you're hit with the reality that our medical system is not going to make everything better. We save lives. Our medical system is amazing at saving lives. I would be so dead if it wasn't for the emergency care physicians. And I have the utmost respect and gratitude and appreciation for them, uh, specifically Dr. Scott D. Weingart, who I found um, in my medical records as the uh, critical care physician who, who saved my life. We are so good at saving lives in our conventional medical system. We are pretty bad at restoring health. And this is where functional medicine comes in. And this is where empowerment comes in. So I coach my clients to empower themselves to speak with their medical team in order to implement practices outside of the standard of care, outside of the five meals a day of fortified glucose syrup, outside of the opiate uh, prescriptions and the, the medications that, that are not serving them, the statins, the 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 addictive the psychotropic medications that don't solve any problems and we go to the root cause and we choose our treatments and by i mean the standard of care can be pretty pretty you know what's the word i'm going for not desirable and yet it's what and the, the standard of care was coined for medical malpractice cases uh, be, for, for suing people. And a medical malpractice case requires that the defendant deviated from the applicable standard of care. So I'm like, okay, so what is that? And to look that up. In a medical malpractice case, it's the type and level of care an ordinary prudent healthcare professional with the same level of training and experience would provide under similar circumstances in the same community. Mm -hmm. And if they deviate from the ordinary, same, similar standard of care, they're liable to be sued. So this puts medicine at a standstill. And I have a 100% success rate working with my clients in order to implement practices outside of this. It's great. Be it with nutrition, with supplementation, with medication. And it's all about empowering ourselves. That, that's great. I mean, people need you. They need you to work with them. And I, I love the term you use, partner. I mean, I've used that so many times. I tell people, you know, um, if you're in, I'm in. If you're not in, it, it's not going to work. And, and the word partner is really, really true. And um, for you, people are looking for help. Maybe on my side, they're coming in and, you know, they're still auditioning for help. But... Um, and, and I agree with you. I, I think our medical d doctors are phenomenal. They can save lives. We have medications to save and extend lives. But in the balance, like you said, staying healthy and getting healthy through lifestyle changes and natural alternatives may not be in their armamentarium in everyday use. I agree with that. Um, you know, you wrote a lot again. I'm, I'm going to pull you back to nutrition. 
Uh, and you talked a lot about the paleo and the keto diet and in the framework of how to feed a brain. Could you expand on that and give some people uh, some ideas about paleo and keto and why it helps with the brain? Yeah, it was kind of, you know, I, I, I did a lot with nutrition and looking at different, um, I mean, there's, there's a thousand diets out there, fad diets, whatever. And like, this is going to help the brain. This is the brain diet. This is like whatever. And there honestly actually weren't very many um, neurological based like diets out there at the time. Um, but what, but I did a lot of research and it's also just getting and seeing how it gets really complicated. And I'm like, let's reel this in. This doesn't need to be so complicated. We are human beings. We have lived on this planet for a long time. And for that very long time, we have adapted to the foods we've been eating. So what are the foods we've been eating for a long time? What are, the, what are the foods that our digestive system is used to consuming? Well, it would make sense to eat the foods that were our digestive systems evolved from consuming. So I was, I mean, it looks to me like we've been eating pretty much a hunter-gatherer sort of diet for a long time, we would, we, would, we would kill an animal, we would eat the whole animal, head to toe, all of it, or we would use all of it, including the fat. I mean, like this whole thing about trimming the fat, mm. it's like, we would never do that, right? And so eating an animal and in foraging and eating vegetation, above ground mostly, and grains were kind of out. Like grains are the seeds of grasses. And uh, I mean, we, we might make something with grains. Um, and by the way, corn is a grain. And, and uh, you know, there's like, there's Native Americans who would like, who would like grind that into maza. But when you think of it, they needed to like sit there and grind that stuff for a very long time and put a lot of effort into creating a flower. And today we have industrial machines that make flour and that make, you know, sugar and like these really palatable foods that we would never have eaten in the past until we have these huge machines of industry, again, industry that, that, are creating these foods, quote unquote foods, that we can consume um, easily, extremely easily, when it would have been a lot of work to make that happen. So, so just thinking, all right, what makes sense? Eating foods that we you see, that makes a whole lot of sense to me. So that's where paleo came in. And, um, and I, I really, I, I began following the, like, just people in the paleo group and on top of it, not being so dogmatic about things like being like, yeah, that makes sense. I'm going to follow something like that, you know, something like that, close to that, um, take away the food, the flowers and the processed sugars and things that we wouldn't have been able to eat and eat mostly foods that we would have been able to eat. And when it comes to keto as well, that's, that's super good for the brain. So uh, it, it looked like you wanted to say something. So go right Yeah, ahead. yeah. I, I wanted to surmise what you were saying. You're doing a great job. So the paleo is sort of a hunter gatherer, no grains, um, you know, Jack Lane once said, if man makes it, I won't eat it. Great job. 1936 chiropractor and the keto, what you're getting into is more of a fat based. So I think that's why we like it. Cause we know fat feeds the brain and keto. There's a lot of studies for epilepsy and in the brain. So that combination between the two, it's just brilliant. Um, on your part to utilize them, not that the Mediterranean diet doesn't have good literature also, 
high carbohydrate diets, crappy foods, processed foods, which are high carb diets do. So that's a huge takeaway. Well, I wanted to touch on what you said about ketogenic and, uh, and seizures. So I, I'm, uh, I was working with a client who, who was in a, in a tragic car accident with his, with his daughter, his, his baby daughter. Um, I think she was six months old. I'm sorry for shaking my head. I've rubbed my face. Every time you tell me something, I can't. And it's, uh, my emotion. I'm, I'm not shaking my head at you. I want everybody watching. I'm not shaking my head at Kevin. It's just like, you know, an accident with a child. Uh, yeah, no. It's, all, all these things, these, these are I, I, I'm, things. This, this is stuff that I, I work with daily, um, is people in really, really rough situations. And, I mean, he, he lost his wife in this accident as well. And his... His daughter was, is developing, you know, and she was having seizure activity um, all the time, several times a day. And they were giving this baby anti-seizure medications and try, and, and I came in and started working with him. And after, he was he was with the medical system doing anti, doing everything he could for his child because clearly he's going to do everything he can for his child and she was she was still experiencing seizures within 3 months of us working together she's seizure free that's great seizure that's great. free and has not had a seizure for months it's awesome. And this is with, with diet. So ketogenic, ketogenic, real food. Um, and ketogenic is also ketogenic uh, paleo style. Because again, if, it, if, if man made it, I don't want it, right? <laughs> like, so, and that includes industrial seed oils. So oils, like if you, I, I wrote a whole series of articles, uh, feedabrain.com forward slash fat chance. I wrote a series called the fat chance because I was really diving into ketogenic metabolism and how it can help me. And then looking at industrial seed oils and you, there's a video on, on one of those uh, on that series that shows how industrial seed oils are made, where these huge machines squeeze thousands of seeds and extract a few drops. Um, that's not how we got oils. So a proper ketogenic diet is a paleo style ketogenic diet. And it's basically eating mostly greens, meat, and animal fats for the most part, as well as coconut oil and, and other like fruit oils with large seeds are much easier to extract oil from. And we would have had those oils as well. You know, so I wanted to touch on that. I want to piggyback on what you said. People say fruits. We all know fruits are healthy, but not a plethora of fruits. You know, um, it's been said that nature gave us fruits four months out of the year. So we're really not made to have sugar all the time. It's just that man has made sugar available to us, yet we've seen all this increase in obesity, diabetes, and brain issues. So you make a great point about, I loved it how you talked about the, uh, like a construction site. So digestion, nutrients, and um, the clinician. So obviously food is information, food can be inflammation, but food can be healing. What's very interesting about the clinician in that aspect that you talked about, you spoke a lot about your rehab, about neurooptometry and functional neurology. So why don't you say what it was and what it did for you? Because, okay, we got the nutrition down, but what about the practitioner? Right, right, let's build the bridges now, right? Right. So, so yeah, when it comes to building the bridges, um, functional neurology is, 
is really amazing usage of what we know about the brain mm -hmm. um, and utilizing functional movements in a lot of ways to stimulate the brain in different ways to rebuild pathways. And this, it gets pretty complicated, but what I really love about functional neurology also is they bring in all sorts of modalities. Low level light therapy, gyro stimulation, vestibular therapy, um, vibration platforms are super uh, useful as well. Hyperbaric oxygen, and it, I, you know, the first presentation I ever gave was actually to the Neurooptometric Rehabilitation Association, and then, and this is where we're marrying functional neurology and neurooptometry because what we want to do, I believe in synergistic therapies, and that's what my presentation was about: synergistic therapy. The effect of therapies done together is greater than the sum of their parts. So when we can bring together different aspects, it's powerful. So with the optometry, it's using eye movements and, and functional neurology uses neurooptometry as well to a great degree. But neurooptometry really dives in and takes a really close look at the eye using video nystagmography, which is, uh, is it, it, you wear these goggles that videotape your eyes as you're given visual stimuli, and we can see the involuntary movement of your eyes from that and match it up to normal function and rehabilitate the brain. Because check this out. We have, 12 cranial nerves that bring information in and out of our brain. They're basically like super highways to the brain. 12 super highways to and from the brain. Four of them are dedicated to the visual system. Four of them are dedicated to like 1% of your body's real estate. One third of the highways that bring information to and from your brain do nothing but that. So your eyes, you, you hear your eyes are the window to the soul. Your eyes are literally a window to the brain and they're a therapeutic window to the brain. That's correct. And everything you said, that's fabulous. And I'm very happy you used the word superhighway because you know my book in February is superhighway to help all of us get the brain axis. So I'm sitting here and I've got some of you can't see the director, Stephanie's right here, and I'm like trying to tap her going, do you hear that, do you hear that? I got the right title, yes. Um, but you're 100% correct. Everything's in the eyes, the gaze stabilization, Carrick, Dr. Ted Carrick, genius, father of functional uh, neurology, neurology, just did, um, I think it was uh, 2018, it came out in uh, Frontiers of Neurology, it yeah. was September or August, where he did a study, and it came out and how we had hot head and eye movements. So you're right on it. Anybody comes in my office, we're always testing the eye. It's a great way for a test, like you said. It's a great way for clinical. And I know you have had that done to you. You worked with a couple of functional neurologists. Um, yeah. uh, I think you worked with Dr. Thomas Cullerton, great guy. Uh, mm -hmm. Also great at functional medicine. I know that you were in contact with, again, Dr. Karazian and, and a whole bunch of others. Mm -hmm. So... Um, there's a lot to say. First off, I, I want to, I have my list here. So and I want to Dr. Carrick, uh, he, I, I've been going to the International Symposium on Clinical Neuroscience, which is Dr. Carrick's symposium every year since 2015. Great. I think I'm one year. But yeah. One year, you're not missing anymore. Yeah, it's good stuff. We feed a brain in so many ways, nutritionally, emotionally, and spiritually, like you said. What's one or two things people can do starting now to optimize their brain function and upgrade their lives? Mm. All right. Love it. So let's, let's start with nutritionally, omega-3s. The high DHA omega-3s. How that's, high? that's one of the best things you can do for your brain. As far how high? As Let's go for it. Tell them how high, Kevin. How high? 
So the the studies are the like the the meta analysis I was talking about said that six grams of DHA alone is totally safe, but you can go way higher than that. You can go up to uh, nah, I I don't go above thirteen grams usually. What do you do? You're right in the, you're right in the sweet spot, four to six to get that impact, that indelible impact. And 12 to 18 in the first week in acute, depending on the weight, it's fantastic. What else? Mm -hmm. You got fish oils. Fish oils are fantastic. Mm -hmm. The next thing is kind of what I started this interview with, which is feeding your mind with, with feeding your mind with the sensory diet that it it needs in order to build the pathways you want to build. So there's therapy with the entire uh, bridge analogy I gave and the skilled workers being, being the therapy, the targeted therapy. But along with that, what we think, what we give our attention to, that grows. So the analogy I have here is your brain is your garden. You have 86 billion plants in your garden because you have 86 billion neurons in your brain. Your thoughts are the seeds and your attention to those thoughts, that's the sunlight and water. And ask anybody who understands neuroplasticity, those thoughts you give your attention to grow. They get stronger, they synapse with each other. So what are you giving your attention to? Because that's the currency of our neurology. We even say it, pay attention. That's the currency of our neurology, which makes it the currency of our social structure, of our, of our world. And when we can choose to place our attention on the aspects, on the thoughts that we want to grow, because we all have weeds in our garden, and it's not like we can pull the weeds. It doesn't work that way but we can give the attention to the flowers we want to grow. And after a while, the roots of those flowers take over the roots of the weeds. And that, my friend, is how we grow a beautiful garden. I love it. I love it. I love the metaphors. They become extremely evocative. It's fabulous. So I had said at the beginning when I brought you on um, that we're friends and we are, and, I, and I'm happy to call you a friend. And I don't use that term as uh, loosely. I call people colleagues and things like that, but we're friends. We bonded and everything. And again, you're an inspiration because, you know, when I think I'm working too hard or, you know, stuff gets a little tough, I realize what you've had to overcome. So my torticollis and my little stuff that's a problem becomes very, quite small. And, you know, again, I appreciate that we have a common ground. We just want to help people. And, you know, we really love to help their brain. You know, we want to rewire. I want to rewire their brain. You want to regrow their brain cells. So I hope people watch this. I hope people reach out to you and, you know, stay the course. You know, you know what I mean? It's always better to be a man of value than a man of success. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you so much, Dr. Silverman. Always a pleasure. And as always, let me know how I can support you. I love what you're doing. And you just, uh, did. You just did. You came on the podcast. You shared your story. <laughs> so everybody, tell everybody about this one. This one's all about the brain. Personal uh, experience. Kevin Ballister. Dr. Robert, what's yours again?